American Free Trade Agreement, recognizing that that agreement has not been beneficial to the United States of America. But in Washington, D.C., the president is getting tremendous pushback, primarily from Wall Street, but really the most, the most ardent opposition to the reforms of the North American Free Trade Agreement are from our industry. Agriculture is pushing back harder than any other industry. And one of the arguments they make is a strong argument. What I'm showing you here is a graph of the exports of agriculture and related products that the United States sends to Canada and Mexico and have been doing so since 1992. So in 1992, we were exporting about $10 billion of agricultural and related products to Canada and Mexico. In 1994, NAFTA was implemented. So we've gone through 23 years of NAFTA and our exports of agriculture related products have increased fourfold. We started out at $10 billion, we're now at nearly $45 billion, fourfold increase. So agriculture says that this is proof that you should make no substantive changes to NAFTA, you should only make minor tweaks. But what the lobbyists, the entrenched lobbyists in Washington have not told you or the members of Congress is that this is only half the equation. So if you take the full equation and you overlay the imports of the same commodities, agriculture related products from Canada to Mexico being shipped to the United States, we see the blue line up here. So this is the maroon line we looked at before, $10 billion in exports, grew to about $45 billion over the course of 23 years. But while our exports certainly did increase, that ignores the fact that the imports exploded. Imports increased from about 11 billion back before NAFTA, and they're now around 60 some billion today. So what has happened is the imports have offset the benefits that we have been derived from the exports, and we're looking at the zero line here, and this is the balance. We had a negative balance of about $2 billion before NAFTA started. So already we had a deficit with Canada and Mexico. But after 23 years now, that deficit has grown to negative 18 billion. So our exports of agriculture related products, this is everything. This isn't just cattle. This is crops, this is grains, this is sheep, hogs, everything, have increased fourfold. The deficit, the burden on America has increased ninefold. This is what Congress is not being told and what you're not being told from the agricultural lobbies. So we're going to talk about the cattle industry today, single largest segment of American agriculture. You generate $70 billion a year in the sales of cattle and calves. So here we're looking at the largest segment of American agriculture. We're looking at the same type of a chart, but we're using a graph instead of a line. So we're starting NAFTA right here in 1994. And we had about $1.3 billion of exports of, of cattle, beef, beef variety meats, and processed beef to Canada and Mexico. And we can see that over the course of 23 years, our exports of our products produced here in the United States of America and exported to Canada and Mexico have indeed increased significantly, rising from $1.3 billion to well over $2 billion. Pretty substantial. And that's why the National Cattlemen's Beef Association and the American Meat Institute and all of the meatpacking lobby argue that you should do no harm in renegotiating NAFTA. This is why they're pushing back on the president so hard is because they said this is critically important to our industry, but it's only half the equation. Because what they're not telling Congress or you is that while we have indeed the maroon graph, while we have indeed increased exports significantly to Canada and Mexico, the imports that we have encouraged from those two countries as a result of this agreement have far overshadowed the benefits that were derived from the increased exports. As a result, we've had a, a persistent deficit of over a billion dollars over the course of 23 years and a total cumulative deficit that is burdening your U.S. cattle industry of about $32 billion over the course of NAFTA. This is the real picture of NAFTA. And if we look at what happened in just the last four years, because you've all heard we've had record exports, indeed we have. But what they're not telling you is we've had even much larger volume of imports. And as a result, 
we've had over $2 billion in deficits just over the last four years. So here's how this works. Let's say we go down to the casino, we're sitting at the card table. And every time I give you $4, you give me $2 back. I give you $4, you give me $2 back. How long are you going to play that game? Until I quit, right? Well, we finally have a president who understands this is stupid. Why would we be supporting a trade strategy in which we consistently lose year after year after year, and we're, even have, we're having to pay for that deficit either by borrowing or we're going to have to sell assets? Ever wonder why we're selling so many assets to, to Chinese firms like Smithfield Farms? It's because we have a tremendous trade deficit that we have to offset. So that's what's happening in NAFTA, and that's what's not being told to you or to members of Congress. But let's step back a little bit and look at a sister industry of yours, the sheep industry. Similar in biological characteristics, similar in marketing structure, and very importantly, like the cattle industry, the sheep industry does not overproduce. Unlike corn, wheat, and cotton that are storable commodities that we actually produce for the purpose of export, we don't produce enough lamb or mutton, never have, or beef in order to satisfy domestic demand for this product. So like sheep, the cattle industry underproduces for the domestic market. So we're going to look at, well, what's the impact of having this increased volume of imports on any particular livestock sector in the United States? So let's look at the sheep industry. We're starting in 1980, about half a lifetime ago. We're looking at the level of production of lamb and mutton in the United States is the blue graph. The red line represents domestic consumption of lamb and mutton in the United States. The maroon represents the volume of imports of lamb and mutton primarily from Australia and New Zealand. So we start in the 80s and we see that as domestic consumption increases, our production increases. As domestic consumption falls, our production falls. There's a gap there that we make the difference up with these imports. They are added to the top of production. That's how we satisfy domestic demand. When we get to about the 90s, however, when imports begin to represent about 20% of our domestic production, suddenly, beginning in the 90s, we start to displace our annual production of lamb and mutton with cheaper imported products coming from Australia and New Zealand. And by 2006, a relatively short period of time, mid-90s to 2006, the U.S. sheep industry became the first livestock sector in America to be effectively outsourced. Because since 2006, we've had to rely more on imported lamb and mutton in order to satisfy domestic appetite for those products. So you can see, even though domestic consumption remained relatively stable, some volatility, our domestic production fell precipitously, our imports of lamb and mutton skyrocketed, we wiped out over half of our nation's sheep flock, we wiped out 60% of all the sheep producers who had herd sizes of over 100, they're likely not coming back. And this is the trajectory of your industry. This is the same direction the U.S. cattle industry is headed if we don't make some significant changes today. And how did this happen? How did these imports come into America and decimate our U.S. sheep industry? It's a, it's a very complicated, sophisticated formula that the importers use. What they use is figure out what the United States cost of production in their land price is and price your imported product a little bit cheaper. And that's exactly what happened. In 2012, USDA did an investigation to find out why the U.S. lamb price collapsed. What they found was that we were producing lamb carcasses at about $255 in America, but they could import those same carcasses from Australia for $200. There's a $55 savings for the meat packers to buy Australian lamb than there was to purchase U.S. lamb, and they destroyed the sheep industry. $55 a carcass is what destroyed the sheep industry. So let's look at your industry. We're looking at a graph now that's produced by Meat and Livestock Australia because they track the global prices for heavyweight steers. They start in 2010, they go to 2016. So these are various countries' global prices for heavyweight steers. Who do you think the red line is? It's the country that produces the best beef in the world under the best of conditions. It's right at your feet. It's the United States of America. We are the world's leader in cattle prices. Blue is our northern neighbor, Canada. 
produces comparable quality cattle, and their sophisticated strategy for penetrating our U.S. market is figure out what the price of cattle are in the United States and price theirs just a little bit cheaper, which in 2016 represented about $60 per head. But look then at all of these other countries that we import beef from. Argentina, Australia, Uruguay, Brazil. These cattle prices are about $500 a head cheaper than yours. Consequently, the beef produced from those cattle are far cheaper than what you can produce it in America. And what are these multinational corporations attempting to do? They want to continue bringing in this product that they can source far cheaper than they can your product, and yet they want to put that product right next to yours in the grocery store with a uh, USDA inspection sticker on it, and no dis distinction, no differentiation as to what product was produced in Uruguay or what product was produced in the United States of America. It's even worse than that. Because the U.S. Department of Agriculture today allows the meat packers to import raw beef from countries like Uruguay, Argentina, um, Australia, New Zealand, Mexico, Nicaragua, Honduras. They are allowed to bring that raw product into the United States, run it through a U.S. processing plant like JBS, unwrap the package, rewrap the package, and place a product of the USA label on it. And that beef is competing directly against yours and as a result, it's driving down the domestic price of cattle. And so here's what happens as a result of us pursuing this stupid trade strategy for 23 years, for even longer, in fact. We've seen our mother cow herd fall in the last 40 years. We're starting in 1975. We fell in 2014. We woke up and learned that our mother cow herd had fallen to the smallest level in over seven decades, 73 years since our mother cow herd was this small. And the industry will tell you, well, we can explain that. We've had droughts in the United States, and as a result, this is just a temporary cyclical problem, right? Folks, this is 40 years. Where's the trend heading? This isn't a cyclical issue where we're going to rebound and pro suddenly provide opportunities for our young children in this industry. This is an indicator of a shrinking industry. Look at the number of producers. Just since the early 1990s, when NAFTA was passed, we've wiped out 20% of all the cattle producers in this country. But that's only to 2012 because that's the last census data available to us. We don't know how many more producers we've lost after 2012, so we've lost 187,000 just during the pendency of the North American Free Trade Agreement. And then, if we look at the last segment of our live cattle supply chain, the feedlot sector, we see that in the course of just 22 years, we've eliminated 84,000 feedlots out of our U.S. feedlot industry in the United States. Folks, that's 75% of the feedlots that were in business when NAFTA was implemented, they're gone today. So how many of you think, who are selling lightweight calves at your auction yard or in the country, how many of you think that having 84,000 potential bidders for those cattle aren't having a huge negative impact on the competitiveness of your cattle? And what's the trend? This isn't cyclical. This isn't temporary. This is the trajectory that your industry is on. And we can kind of explain why. Not we. The U.S. Department of Agriculture keeps data to determine what is the average return to the United States cattle feeder for feeding cattle in America? We start in January of 2000, and on a monthly basis, we go for 18 years. So here's zero profits, the black line. The blue represents revenues from feeding cattle. The red represents losses from feeding cattle on a per hundred weight basis. You can see instinctively that there are more losses than there are profits. In fact, here is the average return to the U.S. cattle feeder on a per month basis, according to USDA. It's a negative, negative $17.40 per head per month for 18 years. Negative $17.40 per head per month for 18 years. Well, that kind of explains why we've lost 84,000 feeders, right? But it doesn't explain why we haven't lost all the feeders. How could there be any feeders left if this USDA data is correct? And we're going to talk about that a little later in this discussion. But this explains why our cattle feeding sector, the most important segment of our live cattle supply chain, is shrinking at an alarming rate. 
And you were all been told, well, we know what happened when our prices collapsed in 2015. It's because it was your fault. You all were feeding your cattle too long. You were adding too much weight to those carcasses. Our carcasses were at, at the historic highs. And as a result, it's just a simple economic law of supply and demand. It's Econ 101. You increase supplies and suddenly you will dampen demand for your livestock. And that's why your cattle prices crashed in 2015. You all heard that, right? So we look at USDA data and look at the graph starting again half a lifetime ago in 1980. And we see the production of beef on an annual basis was volatile here in the early 80s. In the 90s, we started to increase production. Then it faltered a bit when there was BSE situation up in Canada. Then it increased again. And then here's 2013, when your cattle prices started to increase. Here's 2014, when your cattle prices were reaching the highest nominal prices in history. You had five weight cattle selling for about $300, fat cattle selling for $167. And here you were told when the cattle prices, remember you were told at the beginning of the year that your price is going to stay strong for three years because of the long biological cycle of cattle. It'll take this industry a while in order to rebuild the herd. Several months later, like five months later, your market just started to collapse. Inexplicably a uh, situation where cattle prices collapsed, not following any market fundamentals, but you were told it was your fault because you're producing too much. Not according to USDA data. It shows that in 14 and 15, you produce the smallest volume of beef that your industry has produced since before NAFTA in 1993. So the cause of the increase, the cause of the collapse in prices was not your production. But look at, interestingly, look at the price of beef that consumers have been paying all through this half a lifetime since 1980. You can see that beef prices have continually worked their way upwards and continued to skyrocket throughout the, the entire term of the North American Free Trade Agreement. And here we look at it again. We're looking at fed cattle prices from 2009 all the way up to the peak in November of 2014, and the blue represents choice retail beef prices that consumers are paying. So while your cattle prices were working their way upward as supplies were tightening, beef prices at the retail level were increasing and then when your prices turned around and collapsed, retail prices continued to increase for another eight months. And then when the dust finally settled as it is today, the spread between the live animal and the price that consumers pay for beef is wider than at any time in history. What does that tell us? It tells us the meat packers have figured out how to exploit both ends of the supply chain. They exploit you, the producer, by paying you less than what a competitive market would dictate for your cattle, and they're charging the consumer whatever the market will bear. And you are not sharing in the difference. There's a windfall being made in this industry, and it's everyone downstream from you. It's the packer and the retailer. And so we ask, well, what did cause the collapse in prices in 2015 on through 2016 if it wasn't the increased production that they said was occurring? Let's look at the increases. Remember the first graph we looked at with NAFTA exports? Now we're only looking at NAFTA imports. Imports of cattle, beef, beef variety meats, and processed beef from Canada to Mexico, starting in the North America Free Trade Agreement in 94. Look at the increase in imports. Here's 2012 and 13. 12 and 13. 13 is when the price rally started. And then look what happened in 14 and 15. 41% increase in value in supplies coming into this country while your cattle prices were strong and were supposed to stay strong for three years. The meat packers literally scoured the globe to find as many imports as they could to bring it into your market, to break your market, and 41% in value increase in one year from Canada, just from our neighbors to the north and the south. Overall, worldwide, it was a 27% increase in volume of beef and cattle and beef variety meats and processed beef. How many manufacturing sectors in America could withstand a sudden in a surge of imports amounting to 20, 27, 41% without suffering the consequences that you suffered? A collapse in your cattle prices. This is the, this is the fallacy behind the support for the North American Free Trade Agreement and the erroneous belief 
that this agreement is essential to the overall viability of the U.S. cattle industry. Not only did that agreement not materialize with respect to the benefits that were expected, but that agreement caused just the opposite to occur. That agreement has contributed to the ongoing contraction of your industry and the elimination of opportunities for young people to enter this industry because of the ongoing trends, trend. So just during NAFTA, we've lost 20% of our operations. We've lost 75% of our feedlots. We saw our cow herd hit the lowest level in over 70 years, just a few short years ago. The output fell to the lowest level since before NAFTA in 2014 and 15, our production outputs, and an unprecedented import surge in 2014 and 15 caused the cattle market to collapse. That's the benefits of North American Free Trade Agreement, and that's why we need to do these things. This is what Congress and our new president needs to do in order to reverse this terrible situation we found ourselves in and have in fact supported for the last 23 years. First, we need to reinstate country of origin labeling so you, the United States producer, can distinguish your product in the grocery store to consumers because you produce the best beef in the world under the best of conditions and consumers deserve the right to be able to select and choose USA beef. We have a president who has initiated a Buy American, High American uh, executive order and how can he fulfill that if we are allowing the USDA to unwrap foreign beef and put your label on it and sell it to unsuspecting consumers? We have to reinstate country of origin labeling, and this is the lightning rod. This is the issue that the meat packers are pushing back the hardest. The reason is because this is the issue that prevents the meat packers from capturing control over your live cattle supply chain. This distinguishes you in the marketplace. This allows you to compete head to head with the 18 different countries that these meat packers are sourcing their beef for. The most important thing we can do in the NAFTA renegotiation is reinstate country wars and labeling. Then what we should do is follow the example of the president applying it in the steel and the uh, aluminum industries. Let's impose tariffs on those countries who are engaged in unfair trade practices. How do we know when a country is engaged in unfair trade practices? If a country persistently accumulates a trade surplus with respect to the United States, that should be a per se violation of fair trade practices and we should take steps to level the playing field. Tools are among, or tariffs are among the tools available to us to strike that rebalance in trade agreements. We should use them in the North American Free Trade Agreement. Then we need to revise the rule of origin because not only do we allow the meat packers to import foreign beef, put a USA label on it after the unwrap and rewrap, sell it to unsuspecting consumers, we allow today cattle from Canada and Mexico to come into the United States in sealed trucks. They never see daylight on U.S. soil. They're unloaded right at the Packer gate. They're slaughtered in Greeley, Colorado. The resulting meat is labeled product of the USA, and that meat is shipped duty-free under a free trade agreement to South Korea, to Singapore, and to many of the 20 countries we have free trade agreements with. What's happening there? The meat packers are stealing your good names and reputation by taking your trademark, product of the USA, and they're putting on beef that could be from a cow that was 14 years old imported from Mexico. And that's what the consumer picks up and eats and they don't have a good uh, experience in, in eating that product. They're gonna turn your product down. You are being harmed by not being able to distinguish your product in the marketplace and the rules of origin in the North American Free Trade Agreement are antiquated, they're misleading, and they are in fact deceptive. The rule of origin should be the origin is its country in which an animal was born, raised, and slaughtered. Finally, we need to include a safeguard in these agreements to protect our industry against import surges like what occurred just very recently that had the effect of collapsing our domestic marketplace. But the meat packing lobby will argue against every one of these and say producers don't want these because this will limit your marketing opportunities. Right? Haven't you heard that? None of this is good for the U.S. cattle producer. Folks, not having this is outstanding if you're a multinational meat packer and have meat packing facilities and feedlots in Brazil and Canada and Australia and in the United States, and you had no particular loyalties to the United States, and that's why we have a president who passed the Buy American Initiative. We need to help him by making sure consumers can actually follow his directives. 
So, that's the message that I gave to congressional members, members of the administration, and to manufacturers that were in Washington just two weeks ago. And that message has to resound around the country. We have to deliver that message. So one of the most important things you can do is pick up the phone and call the U.S. Trade Representative tomorrow or Monday morning. Tell them reinstate country of origin labeling in the North American Free Trade Agreement. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But 